All right, can everybody hear me? Okay, excellent. So let's get started. I'm Roberto Rivera. I'm professor and chair of the Landscape Architecture plus Environmental and Urban Design department here at FIU. And I'm accompanied by uh, an incredible panel. You'll uh, meet them here shortly. I'll do some introductions when we, uh, when we start the panel portion. But I thought um, we want to start with the basics and the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and we started on this journey, I think, looking at, as I'm sure some of you are familiar with the SDGs, um, looking at ways in which academia has a role to play in this, in this process. And uh, Accountable Impact, Scarlett, are you Scarlett? Uh, reached out, uh, you'll hear from her uh, in a minute. Um, she's uh, been involved with the SDGs for a while and the SDG Challenge Competition. Some of our students are participating in that. Um, so let's begin. Um, so what are the UN Sustainable Development Goals? How many of you have not heard of the SDGs? If you're willing to put your arm up. Okay, so there's a few. Okay, great. Well, this is great. This is about accelerating something that's of extreme importance to what we do. It's a global initiative. Um, and the 2030 Agenda for the Sustainable Development adopt, adopted by all United Nations states in 2015, we're at that halfway mark now in 2023, provided a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet. Uh, this shared blueprint is for peace and prosperity. Its uh, goals are, among, among many, is to uh, end poverty and other deprivations that need to go hand in hand with strategies to improve health, education, reduce inequality, and spur economic growth, while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests by 2030. So we have our work cut out for us. Uh, <laughs> uh, and you're gonna hear about where we are with them and what the different roles of academia, uh, policy, industry, and technology have to do uh, with it. I think this brief snippet from the report that was uh, produced by the UN, uh, let me see if I can, I'm not sure why it's not advancing. There we go. Um, by the Secretary General, I think this puts it uh, very succinctly. Uh, the SDGs are a universally agreed roadmap to bridge economic and geopolitical divides, restore trust, and rebuild solidarity. Failure to make progress means inequalities will continue to deepen, increasing the risk of a fragmented, two-speed world. No country can afford to see the 2030 agenda fail. So when we think of these 17 goals, um, it really is uh, 17 goals that are all quite interrelated. I like to think of it as this blurring of these, these boxes. Um, and why is this important? These are some of the reasons. Uh, of course, it encourages social mobilization, uh, it creates peer pressure, very important on the global stage among political leaders. It spurs networks of expertise, knowledge, and practice into action. It mobilizes stakeholder networks across countries, sectors, and regions uh, coming together for a common purpose. And while they are quite ambitious, um, I think it also puts us in a position to ask questions that require due diligence and require data and require a lot of effort to understand where we stand. So if you go to the website, you will see how uh, comprehensive this is. There are 17 goals, each of which has targets, events, publications, actions. Uh, we're gonna be focusing today on two of those 17 goals, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, as well as sustainable cities and why these, why these matter. Uh, within those, and since they were adopted in 2015, each has a series of indicators which tells us how far we've come along or how far we have not come along, along with a narrative. Uh, and Scarlett's gonna talk a little bit more about this, but I encourage you to look at all these. There's amazing resources. As a design school, a school of architecture, we have our hand in all of these goals by uh, just implicitly. Everything that we do touches upon every single one of these goals. So the sobering reality, in a way, is that at this halfway point since they were implemented, 15% um, of these goals are on track out of, you know, uh, out of 100. <laughs> and all the others are either, uh, you know, moderately or severely off track, or there's even stagnation or regression. 
Uh, this is a formula that is worrisome, but I, um, you know, an another uh, quote, if, if you take into account all the crises that we have been through, uh, climate crisis, the war in Ukraine, now the war in Gaza, the global economy post-pandemic, all of these things uh, obviously have a role to play in where, where we stand. But I would like to make the case for optimism. Uh, this is, by nature, every one of our disciplines in design and engineering is an optimistic. We have a stake in our future because we are designers. We are able to think through problems and come up with the right questions. So when we see progress and, and where we are, there's a lot of work to do. Um, but you know, these are essentially giving us a roadmap or a framework uh, to move forward. So today we're going to focus on these two goals, uh, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. We have some excellent partners here to, to speak about their approach to that. Um, as a sector of the economy, of everything that we do, every one of these has so much impact. So it's great to hear from companies who have taken the SDGs to heart, and uh, we'd like to, to know more about what they're doing. And sustainable cities obviously matter immensely because if we manage to live in a world where half of the world's population now is living in cities and is projected to grow to 70% uh, very, very quickly, uh, sustainable cities hold a lot of answers if we can get that, get that right. Um, so within that ecosystem of the SDGs, again, I encourage you to go take a look, uh, take a look at the targets, take a look at the indicators. We're going to talk about all these here momentarily. Um, but it's true, I think, that in our role as faculty, as students, as professionals, we have a stake in this. And for students who are in the audience, you obviously are going to be deciding how you engage with this. So hopefully today's conversation will inspire you to know more about it and to fold that into your work. Uh, with that, I'd like to pass it on to Scarlett. Perfect. Can you guys hear me? Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good, good. <laughs> My name is Carla Lanzas, and I'm the founder and CEO of Accountable Impact. But before I begin, I just wanted to share that I'm a Panther. I did my EMPA here. <laughs> Thank you. I did work here for the Public Administration Department. My siblings weren't here. My niece is now here. So we're a full Panther family. So we love FIU. Um, so Accountable Impact, like I said, is a nonprofit organization that is based in Miami. We started this work in 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic, because we got to thinking that the world needed to um, be more accountable. Companies, institutions need more accountable to the impact that they're making in, in the community they serve or they work or they live on. Um, and our mission is, I don't know if you can see it, but it's quite simple. We activate networks, global, regional, local, and to advance the UN Sustainable Development Goals in South Florida. So what, what exactly does that mean? So FIU right here is a network. This is an activation to advance the SDGs. Not only that, we have members from the, from the private sector, the public sector, and of course you guys, students from academia. So what we do is we'll co-create solutions that most balance sustainable solutions, economic growth, environmental protection, and social progress. But before we get into the SDGs, I wanted to share this um, slide on the Millennium Development Goals. Has anyone here heard about the Millennium Development Goals? You, okay. So the SDGs didn't come out of nowhere. In 2000, they were the, they approved the UN approved the Millennium Development Goals, or better known the MDGs. As you can see from your left, they went from 2020 to 2015. There were only eight goals, and mostly for those goals were applicable for developing countries. I had the honor and privilege to to be working for the UN at that time, so I can tell you how those development goals also were advancing sustainability, but mostly they were eradicating extreme poverty and transmittable diseases. 
Um, I'll, t uh, I'll share in a moment how they, what, what they were able to accomplish and how successful they were. But then in 2015, like Roberto, Professor Rovira was saying, the, the, the world came together to adopt the SDGs. And you can see the difference between eight goals with the MDGs to 17 goals with the SDGs, from 18 targets to 169 targets. And this one in particular, you know, the SDGs, they talk about climate risk, they talk about reducing inequalities, and these ones also incorporate developed countries. So the SDGs, in simple forms, is applicable to small countries, big countries, big cities, villages, companies, universities, you name it. And quickly, just to share what the MDGs were able to accomplish, so they reduced extreme poverty by half. And when I say extreme poverty, it's people living on $1.25 per day. So also children, especially girls, were um, graduating from elementary school. To give you an example of the work that we did through the MDGs, so I used to work for the World Food Program, which is the largest humanitarian agency in the world, and we used to provide food assistance for communities that were, you know, living in, in, in extreme poverty. But it wasn't a, just a handout, it was an incentive for parents in rural villages to send their kids to school. In the Middle East, it served as an incentive for parents to send girls to school. In the Middle East, only boys go to um, um, middle school and high school. So just by giving them a, a food ration, they would send the girls to school. And also the MDGs, um, uh, they cut by 40% new HIV infections. So they were successful. I'm, I'm emphasizing this that the, so if the MDGs were able to accomplish this, imagine what we can accomplish with the SDGs. Um, okay, so I think um, Roberto already covered this. They were adopted in 2015 by 193 nations quickly. From 2012 to 2015, the world came together. Um, scientists, uh, civil society, business, they did global consultations and they agreed on all 17 global goals. And we have a time frame of 2015 to 2030. We have 15 years and we have just eight years left. And um, COVID-19 did not help. It actually reverted the progress that we achieved with the MDGs. So the more reason that why we need to come together and advance the global goals. Quickly, um, I, I always like to provide data so that we can know where we are at the, at, the, at the country level and at the state level. So in 2021, we ranked 32, the US, out of 165 countries. And in 2022, we ranked 41 in the world. So as you can see, we are not achieving, not progressing any of the SDGs in the US. About, um, what about Florida? We rank 33 out of the 50 states. And that's the reason why we're here today, to find solutions to work together, all sectors, private, public, academia, students, nonprofits, individuals, and even the media has to be on board. So I gave you like a <laughs> the sad news, but now we're gonna give you more information on what we're doing to fix this situation. I'm gonna share a quick video. I hope you can enjoy it, let me see. The SDG Challenge helps companies to reach their sustainability goals by putting them in contact with fresh minds, students from all over the country. The SDGs are all about partnerships. The only way we're going to achieve these ambitious goals is by working together. And the great thing about the SDG Challenge is that it brings together businesses and teams from different universities to think about these challenges and to come up with very innovative and creative solutions.
my motivation for working the SDGs challenge is because as a student, it's a nice opportunity to connect to an actual challenge. And because we are all on the team from different backgrounds, we can learn a lot from each other and from the business partner and come up with a very innovative solution. The energy that I see is my favorite part of this challenge. You can really see that it, uh, it inspires students, but it also energizes companies when they see and work together with these students on, on different types of, uh, of challenges. Join us today, improve tomorrow. Okay, so remember when I said we activate global networks? So that's one of our partners, the SDG Challenge. It's a challenge that started in the Netherlands about five or six years ago. Now it's been done in Cape Town, South Africa, in Portugal, and for the first time in the US here in Miami. We're so happy to be presenting it, and we just launched it about a week ago with four major universities in South Florida. You can read it, but it's, it's a student competition where students are paired with local companies um, to help them you know, advance a sustainability strategy, to help them, for example, if they wanted to create a company-wide um, recycling strategy, students are gonna be acting as mini consultants to help those companies find that solution. Um, the, we partner with, with four major universities, like I said, the University of Miami, of course, FIU, Lynn University, and Miami Day College. So we have in total 18 students right now working with four companies to try to solve the, uh, the, the uh, challenge based on the SDG framework. These are some of our um, SDG ecosystem partners. So as you can see, we have from consulates to county, municipal government, companies, nonprofits, and universities. Because like, I, I, I can't um, emphasize enough how important it is to have partners from all different sectors. So the process is we launched the SDG, we had the kickoff, we have every company and, and team of students have a sprint day at their company to better understand their business model, the challenges and opportunities to then create that solution. In between those days, we also have the deep dive, which is exactly what we're doing today. We have a deep dive at each university. We had one at Miami Dade College last week, here at FIU today. Thursday, we have one at Lynn University and in November at UM. And each university decides what SDG is more important to them and what type of event we're gonna be having. And then we're gonna have the finals in November where students are gonna do a pitch to a jury and then they're gonna, the, the best team is gonna win. So it's very exciting. The kickoff uh, was in partnership with the Miami-Dade Beacon Council. Does anyone know what, what the Miami-Dade Beacon Council is? Okay, so the Miami-Dade Beacon Council is the official economic development agency for Miami-Dade County, meaning that they're the ones that are gonna bring, you know, big companies, investors to create jobs in Miami. And I emphasize this, that this is a very important thing that we accomplish, and I'll say just accountable impact, a lot of our partners, because this is the first time that an institution that is, by the way, public and private, really are pushing for the SDGs and for corporations to align the SDGs. In the, what, over five years that we've been doing this work with other partners, even before Accountable Impact was created, we hadn't had this, you know, big push from a big entity in South Florida. So we're very happy to, that, to, have, to have their support. And just quickly, because I know the panel is gonna start soon, this is one of our, the first company, our sponsor, Carbon Cabo Capture, which the founder and CEO is right here joining us, Andrea Irrazal. And it's, uh, you're gonna learn more after we're done with the panel. There's an exhibition outside, but what they do, they use a microalgae technology to capture carbon. And they're focusing on those four, as he's seven, nine, 12, and 13. The Miami Herald, everyone knows the Miami Herald, right? They're also one of our um, corporate sponsors, and they're gonna be focused on SDG 3, 12, and 13. And what they're gonna be doing is their students are gonna be creating a sustainable lifestyle guide that they're gonna be publishing in the Miami Herald, so that every single individual plays a role in, in making Miami a sustainable city for all. Emerging Global Investments is a local investment firm 
that is advancing SDG 7 and 9 through creating a, um, a, a database to rank companies, publicly traded companies that are advancing the SDGs. Impact Hub South Florida, it's, Impact Hub is it's a mix between an incubator, accelerator, co-working space, and event space that exists in over 155 cities around the world. So they're just starting Impact Hub South Florida, and students are going to help them create a business plan and also a um, shared income model. And they're going to be focused on SDG 8 and 9. Um, just a little bit more on how the SDG challenge works. This is a sprint day where students are going to come to the company's offices to learn about the company, uh, the deep dives, what we're doing today. Like I said, we, we had one last week, T today the one at FIU, and then in the coming days and weeks, we're going to have the other two at Lynn and UM. Like I said, there's going to be a final in November. And the reason why we're doing the SDG deep dive is threefold. One, we want to expose students that joined the SDG challenge to best practices, to idea, to, to the experts that are in the field so that they can you know, create better ideas and solutions for their challenge. Two, for all the other students that did not apply because they didn't know that this challenge was around or missed the deadline, to know that next year is going to be available so you can apply. And third is to grow the SDG ecosystem in South Florida. As you can see, we have people from all sectors and from different parts of the county to really advance the SDGs. And I'm just going to end with this quote. This is my favorite quote. Um, the former UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, who was in charge of the UN when the SDGs were adopted said towards the end of his term, our struggle for global sustainability will be won or lost in cities. And that's why we're doing the work that we're doing today. So with that, I'm done. I hope that you enjoyed it, and that, but I'm sure you're going to enjoy even more the panel. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm just going to do a quick introduction for Daniel Sexer. Come on, Daniel. So Daniel Sexer, Shane Debesing uh, from Jacob Rope Systems, they've generally uh, they're generally sponsoring uh, our studio, The Machine in the Garden, this semester. Um, we go back, I've used, if you've been to the Sky Lounge and the Deuxième Maison, this is a Jacob Webnet product, and um, uh, just fantastic work. I will let uh, Daniel speak here, but Daniel's the... Uh, uh, general Manager of Operations for Jacob, and um, when you ask yourself how do you put these ideas into practice, I think you're going to be sharing some really exciting things. So, Daniel, welcome. So, um, yeah, you just advance, right? Would this end with this? Oh. Can you hear me? Maybe it's just too far away. There we go. Now, better? Better? <laughs> okay. Okay, um, as you may know, um, we are in the industry of basically of rope manufacture, uh, but we do a, a, lot, a lot of things. Um, safety products, um, railings, structural, uh, but many years ago, <clears throat> the company started working on uh, old type of, uh, I would say, cultural thing that's uh, very developed in, in Europe. And it was about having green walls. Without knowing enough what, are, what were the effects and, and what are the things that a, a green wall can accomplish. Um, and a few years ago, um, the company moved part of their production line to Vietnam. The first factory that uh, the company owned was a, not exactly that, but it's, it's what is in our mind about, or it was in our mind about what a factory is. And I think that it, it's um, every time that we have to uh, think about um, a challenge of building something, 
I think that this collective things that we have in our mind pops up all the time. And um, um, unfortunately, um, sometimes these are uh, the type of results that we have. Um, a few years ago, the factory, the, the Jacob decided to build another factory uh, in another industrial park outside Saigon, which also was uh, fully covered of uh, the typical industrial buildings that uh, you will see everywhere, especially light industrial factories. If we take the turnpike, we would see this um, type of buildings, right? So um, the challenge was to rethink the archetype uh, of a factory. And um, the good thing is that the owner of the company was really deep involved from day one. And, and um, he tried to ensure that something new um, was needed. And even the, the idea of, of having a factory as a case study of the things based on the things that the, the, the company was developing for the last 30 years. Um, we had a lot of experience on, on, on green wall system. That's what the factory, the company was developing. And um, sometimes uh, we think that there is no enough information about green walls or green roofs or even about this industry, but they are. Uh, so based on our experience, um, living architecture was one of the key players in this new design. Um, um, I'm not going to go deep into, into each of the projects, uh, but um, we did quite a few, uh, especially in Europe. And we were able to develop the techniques uh, to, to arrive, achieve good results. Um, but that was that was part of the of the intention or or, or the um, goals of the company. And um, the first thing to rethink. The, this new factory was starting thinking um, about the site. Saigon, Vietnam, is, um, it's a um, uh, tropical environment, uh, very humid uh, and, and um, very hot. And a few challenges were, were starting popping up. Um, we, we put this slide with this quote because we, want, we wanted also to prove, and we did it. We, we did an investment for two years with the University of Maryland uh, where they check realistic what were, what were the um, um, goals and uh, the benefits of having uh, a green wall. Um, and the, the roots, of course, uh, started in this culture. And um, this is the landscape of Switzerland. So greening is always in their mind. Um, Switzerland, um, <laughs> the owner of the company, uh, also quoted as, as uh, what, uh, two words, but one, one company culture. So um, Peter Jacob, the owner, got really involved with their culture. And that was the other starting point of uh, how they can rethink this building, taking in consideration the culture. So for him and for the professionals that were, were around, 
this project, the, the, one of the goals was to treat this building from a holistic point of view. Uh, there was the building itself, the materials itself, and, and the culture of the people that was, was going to work in, in this factory. Um, so the building, I'm not going to go deep into details now, but what they, the, the, the basic idea was that the building was going to be um, fully covered of a membrane, green membrane, that it was going to supply to the building uh, natural vent ventilation, natural light, and accomplish, um, trying to accomplish all these basic uh, points about sustain sustainability. Um, reduce energy consumption, uh, um, air circulation, as I said, sand protection, reduce temperature, and all those goals were accomplished by this membrane uh, around the building. Um, as I said before, it's a tropical region, rain every single day, hot, very, very similar to the weather here. Um, but it was always, always in, in the design process, it was always present, the uh, culture of this people. And one of the, the most important thing that also was uh, taken in consideration was the people that was going to work uh, in that factory. Um, for phases, we are now on phase two. Um, this is a little bit the, the um, um, mock-up of, of that phase that it's, al it's already done. Um, they took in consideration also um, the less expensive and the, the, the materials that were, they were able to get from Vietnam. In this industrial park, there are thousands of factories that were built somewhere else and brought it, put it on a ship and ship it to Vietnam. Um, basically, the, the factory has a structure of concrete and steel. This is in the process of uh, working on, on the green facade. As you can see, the building, um, which has AC everywhere, and uh, it's proved that having this type of ventilation, empty, um, no uh, single, uh, in certain part of the building, no enclosures, because it has that uh, pure ventilation, um, we, we prove that it's, it's, no, it's AC is not needed. That is a section with, with one of the facades uh, showing <clears throat> something happening, it's not changing. <laughs> Ah, there we go. Excuse me. <laughs> it's working. There was also, <clears throat> um, as you can see, this membrane, it was, it, what they were trying to do is to bring the outside to the inside of, of the factory. So as you can see, here is a corridor where the people work and walk all around the perimeter of the factory. So it's that sensation of in and out all the time. Um, most of the work that we do here is based on manpower. So there is no many machines. So the people spend the day there. Uh, the, the factory is completely open. And the difference in temperature 
goes up to sometimes it goes up to 15 degrees in between the outside in the and the inside That's uh, <coughs> the picture when, when the company's, the, the factory was open. Now we are having around 600 people working, and the goal is to get us to 4,000 people working in this factory. Um, I would like to play this video. Let me see if I can click. hand the factory um, can run with his own uh, power all those solar panels that you can see all around we are capable to um, make uh, make the factory run by itself and um, now it's we are getting to the point that we want it's a challenge is how to how we can stock and keep energy to be resold to the government that is something that is possible in Europe. Um, but the, 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 the thing that the factory can run on his own power is it's something completely out of the box in Vietnam. Not another single factory in that industrial par park that is gigantic runs on his own power. So, the invitation is to rethink some traditional concept, concepts about architecture. That's the goal of Jacob. Thank you, guys. Great. Well, thank you, Daniel. And I wanted to recognize our students from the Machine in the Garden studio. This is a joint architecture landscape students with Professor Cynthia Ochin and myself. You guys raise your hand, say hello. All right, thank you. Okay, so let's uh, now move on. I'll invite the panel up, I'll do some introductions and we'll get going. Okay, everybody's here. Can you hear me? Can you hear the, okay, great. Okay, so I'd like to begin with some introductions and then after the panel, we'll have time for Q and A. And in the courtyard, as Scarlett mentioned, we have a few things on exhibit. Uh, Carbon Bio Capture has their microalgae panels, just impressive piece of technology. Um, Jacob uh, Rope Systems is adjacent to that, and we also have some work that uh, from a studio that focused on using the SDG framework. So that's after this, and I encourage you to come and ask questions and do all that. But let's uh, start. Uh, so we, when in thinking about this panel, we thought it really is a network. It's about all hands on deck. It's about looking at these uh, goals from many different perspectives. So, so from the policy side, uh, Julie Dick, who's a resiliency Policy Advisor of the Office of Resilience for Miami-Dade County is here. And I'll read um, 
a little bit about her bio. She's a seasoned professional with experience in environmental, social, and governance, ESG, water, energy, land use, and sustainability law, regulations, and policy. This is somebody you want on your side. Uh, extensive work uh, with large organizations on environmental and climate related matters is uh, her specialty and uh, expertise in planning and implementing climate change resiliency strategies. Uh, she's worked with multidisciplinary teams and it's a pleasure to welcome you, uh, Julie. <laughs> From the industry, technology, academia side, uh, Francisco de Caso, PhD. Uh, he is the principal scientist at University of Miami within the Department of Civil and Architectural Engineering. His civil and structural engineering research is focused on resilient material systems and encompass challenges related to mechanical behavior, the effect of aging and durability in materials, and design-related aspects of elements and structural components using composite materials. Um, I think also he has a lot of experience with technology transfer. We'll hear a little bit about that and some of the data. So welcome, Francisco. Uh, you heard from Daniel Sexer, who's the managing director, Jacob. He's an architect, actually. And as you saw, uh, Jacob is really on the forefront of setting new standards for industrial uh, development and, and the technology that goes with that. So welcome, Daniel, once again. And my friend and colleague, a registered architect, uh, uh, a fellow of the AIA um, and associate dean of faculty and program development here at the College of Architect or Communication, Architecture, and the, and the Arts, Marilise Nepomechi. Uh, Marilise, uh, it's hard to. Uh, Marilise is is that person that you want to when you grow up. You want to be. She has so much expertise and so much knowledge in administration and technology and architecture. It's Don't really. Don't believe a word you say. <laughs> But her work involves um, writing, research, urban design, um, environmental and cultural uh, and social contexts are a big part of her work. Um, and has been involved since, as far as I can remember, Marilise did uh, a, an exhibit on sea level rise. What year was that, Marilise? 2014. 2014, before, uh, I think, long before, it's such a part of our language now to talk about resiliency. Um, and she showed at the uh, Rotterdam um, uh, uh, Biennale. Yeah, uh, also uh, I think a little bit before that. So um, lots of funded work, a pleasure to have you with us, Marilise. And experience with SDG. All right, and you've met me, so I am going to jump into the questions part of uh, the session. So. And uh, be thinking of what you want to ask these experts. Um, but I want to begin with, uh, with Julie. I think as designers, we often think we hold all the cards. Uh, we, you know, we can imagine the questions. We can come up with the answers. We do this in school. And, but reality sets in when you realize how important the power of policy is. And you've been operating in this world for a while. So I, I wonder how the SDG uh, conversation has changed what you do, how you approach it, how you think about what you do. Sure. Um, well, for Miami-Dade County, um, we have probably a couple of different frameworks that are relevant and they all tie back to the SDGs, I would say. Um, for this mayor, everything we do, she likes to tie back to what she calls the four E's, economy, environment, um, equity, and engagement. And engagement, I think of as more of a, an implementation piece maybe of everything, but I think all, all the, the first three really could tie to any one of the, S, the SDGs. And then in our office, the Office of Resilience, um, which is under the mayor's office, we really work across the county in implementing sustainability. And, and we have seven teams, but um, one communications, again, goes to that engagement piece, but, um, Really, most of them are on the substantive side. We, we have heat, um, and, and that, I think, ties very well to SDG 3 and, and 15 and, and 13, so good health, life on land, climate action. We have a, a bay team um, that goes to life below water, water quality and sanitation. We have an adaptation team going to sustainable cities and, and communities. Future ready, that's our planning side, and that that's all the work we do on you know, planning for, for Miami-Dade County, and, and there's a lot of policy involved in that as well. Um, the mitigation, that's affordable 
clean energy, climate action as well, and zero waste. Um, and that, again, goes to, to SDGs around industry innovation infrastructure, as well as uh, around um, materials and circularity. So everything we do fits in with the SDGs, and it really gives us a common language to speak um, about sustainability work really globally. I mean, our, our mayor is involved with, um, there's a sustainable development um, solutions network that the mayor of Paris started that we've supported in our office. And, and we have to be able to talk about the work we're doing in a way that we can discuss with, with the, these mayors from around the globe. And the SDGs give us a way to do that. Um, but from a policy perspective, I'd say um, policy is critical. I mean, that's how we implement and operationalize a lot of these items. Um, and, and it varies. I mean, one of the things I've been working on a lot lately is we have a, a new initiative called Purpose Driven Procurement. And the policy there is sort of implementing existing policies. We've had policies on the books, whatever else, but now every, every procurement that goes through the county, we're looking at how we're in implementing our existing policies and ensuring that those are adapted. So that is actually really meaningful and can have really significant impact. Um, our office works across departments. So we're working a lot right now with the Department of Transportation and Public Works. When you think about every... DTPW project, all these county roads across the county. I mean, we're engaging with them, consulting with them, figuring out how we can ensure that those projects are adapted to climate change, that um, these measures are being taken into consideration, and also that they're, you know, taking steps to, to reduce runoff, protect our waterways. So all those things tie back to the SDGs. There is a policy component in that, and we need, we're updating working with them and updating some of their planning manuals, some of their the general just county policies. We have what we call a comprehensive development master plan, which is kind of our constitution for the county. Um, and a lot of our sort of overarching policies are in that, but then we have a municipal code and everything has to go through that. And we have various other vehicles that the mayor can use and that the county commission can use to implement those policies, but th those, policy vehicles are really how we get things done, and that's how we ensure that um, these goals are met and that we can achieve the sustainability purposes that, that we seek to um, get done. Excellent. Thank you, Julie. I, I love that purpose-driven procurement, because when you think of procurement, it's at least for me, it's hard to get excited. <laughs> But when you put it that way, <laughs> I try to remind myself when I spend so much time on it. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, that machinery is in place and has been in place in a certain kind of a set of assumptions. Mm -hmm. And when we bring in the SDGs, it's changing that paradigm a bit. So it makes sense that you would change, um, change that 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 procurement uh, approach. Um, question for Marilis from uh, Academia. How do you feel the SDG effort has been either embraced or operationalized or changed the ways that we work in academia from, from your experience? Ah, okay. Um, is this on? Yep. Okay, great. So um, it's, it's a great question, and obviously we're in the middle of a university. This is the place to be asking that for those of us who are teaching, those of us who are learning, and, and the rest of us who are just happy to be invited to the conversation. Um, I've, um, I'll, and I think I'll answer it a couple of different ways, if that's okay. So from a sort of larger, maybe world perspective, I've had um, the good fortune to be um, the co-director of the Education Commission of the UIA, which is the, Un the International Union of Architects. It's an organization that was created after the destruction of World War II, a group of architects from around the world who thought that this was our moment. We were going to rebuild the world that was in ruins, and this was a time where an architectural perspective on the enterprise was going to make a real difference. Um, the UIA just turned 75 years old, and its earliest commission was about education. You know, how do you train a, series, a group of professionals in the design discipline to create an environment that would be supportive of, of a healthy and, and well-conceived life? Um, and the, um, the UIA thought that as 
professions got increasingly international and global in their scale. I can study in the US, practice in Europe, and actually build buildings in Vietnam. <laughs> um, and that that's not an unusual thing, that it made a lot of sense for the educational credentials that you gain in one part of the world should be viable in another part. And so UIA became very interested in credential portability for professionals, but also for, for education. Um, and they worked with UNESCO to create the UNESCO UIA Charter on Architecture Education. It was intended to be a kind of series of principles that would ensure that architects were trained in a way that made them really successful professionals wherever they went. And it's a living document. It was created a number of years ago, and it gets updated every three years. The most recent updates focuses specifically on the SDGs. Um, and it is a kind of statement of principle that says that the sustainable development goals are absolutely critical to the way that we educate architects. But more than that, it has a really practical arm to it. Um, every accreditation agency in the world that belongs to the Canberra Accord on Architectural Education, and that addresses most of the Americas, a big part of Asia, part of South America, and a good part of Europe. Um, all of them base their accreditation standards on the UNESCO UIA Charter, which means that with this new addition that focuses on the SDGs, those organizations that um, regulate the way in which architecture education is actually delivered, what that curriculum is and what its aspirations are, are now going to be looking at the SDGs as a really practical necessity in terms of how they conceive that curricula. This is critical, right? And it has the potential to make an incredible difference. So that's a kind of global answer um, to how the SDGs are affecting what we do. In, in local terms, right, uh, what we're doing here at FIU, of course, you know, and, and those of you who are in the room know really well that we have curricula across the disciplines of the School of Architecture and arguably across the university that focus on the SDGs, on sustainability, on resilience, on social justice, on all of the elements that the SDGs really address in one fashion or another. One of the interesting things that we have found in recent years is that the big organizations that rank universities are looking to the SDGs as the way in which that ranking is done. And so no matter whether you're studying biology or chemistry or engineering or design, um, you're going to be judged at a university level by how the way that you teach and what you're teaching is in some way addressing the, the kind of imperative that the SDG represents. So um, here we've done um, exhibitions, we've done um, conferences, most recently Resilient Cities with ARCC, the um, Architectural Research Centers Consortium, and the EAAE, the European Association for Architectural Education, here a year ago. Um, we do studios every semester in architecture, landscape architecture, interior architecture that address the SDGs. We have amazing research um, that looks at materials and technologies of resilience. Um, I, I, think, I think they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. I think that more and more they become the basis of the way in which we judge um, the viability of what we do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marilis. I mean, I think that the conversation of, of um, rankings is really um, such a powerful lever because if, if you didn't know, the S School of Architecture at FIU has been for three years top 20 among public universities by the QS World Rankings, and we are fourth, w, uh, Wall Street Journal, I think, is fourth. Uh, in the country. So these are um, proud moments for an institution of this, this youth, really. But everybody looks at rankings. Everybody wants to be on that list. Um, so if you manage, I think, to change that um, or influence that with something like the SDGs, I, I think that's really a, a major, <laughs> major lever that's uh, in play. 
Um, great. So, uh, and Charlotte, can we advance to uh, Francisco? So Francisco, um, you have a background in science and civil engineering, um, structural engineering, and your work with carbon biocapture, some of which we can see outside. Um, how has, how, how is that influenced or how is, how are the SDGs informing what you do or changed what you do? So um, I'll be concise because I'm sure there's a lot of questions, but I think I'm going to answer this as a, as a chair with four legs. And I think when, when we're studying whatever career you're choosing in architecture and whatnot, a lot of things, these are tools that you're learning, right? And hopefully you apply those tools. It's that process of application, I think, that informs a lot of the SG, SDGs. I think the first leg is scalability. Mm -hmm. right, to reach many of these goals, the scale of the solutions that we choose need to be real. Right? Taking it from, from a sketch in a drawing into a little prototype in, in your garage, into maybe a, a bigger prototype into a lab, and then, and then implementing it. Scalability is a good filter to move on to the next idea if it doesn't hurt, work. And as a civil engineer, we're very good at finding efficiencies. Right. Mm -hmm. I think the second leg is, is very important. I think it applies to everybody, is doing things differently and, pardon me, doing things differently and doing, doing things differently and, and finding ways to do things differently. So, do, pardon me, do different things and do things differently. That's two parts, I was mixing them, sorry. So you gotta do things differently. Whatever it is that you're doing, do it differently. But the things that you are doing them, you also have to do differently. So it's trial and error, right? Let's not get too complicated. And don't worry about making mistakes. I think engineers were very good at, you know, making mistakes and being proud of it and finding the next way. So I think uh, from, from that point of view, don't be afraid of making a mistake. I think, unfortunately, education and the rankings and the grades in a sense, has forbidden students to make mistakes. Mm. And that is, that's troublesome because we need to make mistakes to find what, not, what doesn't work and when what works, right? Mm. So the third leg of the chair, I think, is also very important. You make a, 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 an analogy. It's local relevance, right? Yeah, and I think architects do this. You borrow ideas from here and you get from there. And, and then you sort of merge it and you adapt it to what makes sense for your project, in your community, in your street, right? And that's a good thing. That has, that's, that has been the history of humankind, mm -hmm. right? We shouldn't be afraid of some copied plagiarism, but it's not that, right? You're not copying it, you're adapting it. Engineers do this a lot, right? You get this idea and you adapt it. And local relevance and solutions that are good for here might not be good somewhere else. So you have to be ballsy and make sure that they're local. And I think in carbon biocapture, you know, we can get those algae and adapt them to the local needs without, you know, making genetically modified algae, which is a huge issue for the other algae technologies. And the last leg of, of this chair, um, which I think maybe is, is, is what goes up most hard, is in terms of data, right? That's the scientist behind me. We love data. We've heard in the presentations how data and the metrics are very important. That's not enough, right? The data, what is data? It's information. Right? And that's the engineer me. Okay, I've got my information. Is that enough? Maybe in the same in procurement. No, it's not enough. <laughs> the information changes into knowledge. Right? And that is the end result. You gotta go through that process. If you have poor data, that's poor information, that knowledge is incorrect. And what happens? We make decisions from that knowledge. Mm -hmm. So th that is critical, right? That's the scientist on me. We got to have right data. You got to go through the process and then make decisions. So I think that's the four-legged stool and a lot of the uh, technology in carbon ca capture has been over 10 years of data being collected and understanding how this will sort of project to the future. So hopefully that helps. Excellent. Yeah, I, I think that's a really uh, important point. Um, if we were to live our lives based on what data tells us, it would be quite boring, I think. <laughs> Um, and I think like in a, in a school of architecture um, here, you anywhere, uh, really it's about balancing, I think, how much data, how much of that information, how much analysis and inventory you do. But at the end of the day, there's also this difference between just making things work 
sustainability as a flat line versus thriving, you know, and finding ways, the poetics of things. And, and hopefully the SDGs help us push those questions in the right uh, direction. Um, Daniel, uh, so you told us a little bit about the factory in Vietnam. That, that was a massive shift, I think, you know, clearly from the pictures and what's around it. But uh, like what, that's a major, I think, uh, turn, right? Yep. What was what was the the why? Like, what was the epiphany, and whose epiphany was it? Um, I think that uh, one of the things is picking up what uh, Francisco said. Data is not enough. So the factory, as I said, it was in one, in a way a, like a case study, and we wanted in a way also to prove that most of the th things that we were proposing in terms of design, at the end, we're going to work. And those things were accomplished. I mean, it's a, 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 we had the chance to be there, so you don't have to turn the AC because the temperature really reduced during the day. Uh, ventilation works, natural light works. Um, but I think that the fact of being a case study is also to prove this new quote. Me as a professional, I have been hearing this for many years that, and it's a pity to hear that thing is, um, the best building is the building that we are not building. <laughs> so uh, I think that our crew of people, our staff is to push young professionals new professionals to start thinking in a way uh, in terms of um, sustainability because creating a building is a big impact. Um, and uh, the, when you walk around this factory and you see what is around, <laughs> you can see the impact. For example, I'm gonna make say something that it, it, it might sound obvious. You walk through miles of factories without a single tree. In this factory, taking in consideration the people that are there for hours, the, the company decided to plant fruit trees so people can take the, the fruit from, from the land. Um, they can walk around, um, if they have a break, they can use the, the, the green plaza that is in, in the middle, play sports. So it's really, really put, it put together the, inten the intention of being uh, um, uh, a, a case study, something that is working. Uh, on the other hand, all of those things uh, in terms of uh, sustainability were taken in consideration. Uh, the way uh, water treatment, energy, uh, is not an isolated thing that the only thing because we are experts in green walls was the only thing that was important for, for the design of the factory. The layout was important, that not every single room or uh, any room that has a particular uh, function is exactly the same as the, the other one. Uh, in the last 34 years, we, we were seeing buildings that uh, the four facades, south, east, west, and north, are the same. And because we are wealthy enough and because we can afford, that doesn't mean that we should do it in terms, for example, of energy. Mm -hmm. Here is, is it not, not the, at the university, but in general, we can see buildings, New York, a hundred story building. So again, the invitation uh, it's to rethink that facing south is not the same to facing north in Vietnam or in the United States. Mm -hmm. And that um, even again, if you can afford to pay the energy bills there and you can you, you, you should not do it if it's not necessary. And basically that uh, 
a building is an impact in any place. Mm -hmm. uh, here, there, it's, uh, it, it's something that it has to be keep in mind. I mean, mm -hmm. so important. huge impact. Yeah, it kind of makes me think. I just thought, w you know, it's it's considered the, the building with the same facade, you know, no matter where you are in the car. It's like uh, it's thought of as a thermostat problem versus a building problem. Right? <laughs> you just, you just got to adjust the thermostat. <laughs> That's the wrong way of thinking about it. Um, but I appreciate, uh, you know, I think it goes back to what Francisco was saying is about yeah. taking chances with your design. I, I'm sure that it was a moment, you know, kind of an important moment to decide to do something completely different. But, you know, it has seemingly worked out very well. And I think that, that's, I think, a lesson that we can all take. It's not in theory. You're actually putting it into practice and you're walking the walk. And I, I really appreciate um, what, what Jacob has done with that. So we're running a little um, uh, late on time. So I'm going to um, jump and ask for some, some brief uh, answers. But it's more thinking about the future, considering who we have in the audience, um, uh, not a cliche, the next generation, you know, mm -hmm. is, is here in front of us. Um, what advice would you give students and faculty eager to take part in the SDGs um, and do their part? How would you, in any, of, in any order? I'll go ahead and break it. And uh, uh, I think a colleague who's a material scientist, uh, Dan Schratman, said it best, is human ingenuity is at the core of sustainable development, right? The person is the most valuable resource. So, you know, the answer lies on us. And I had this, this slide, the previous one, that, you know, we're in the decade of making it happen, uh, 2020 to 2030. Because what we do now is what, you know, think of it, you're planting the seed, it's gonna grow, and then we can collect the fruits out of that. And if we don't plant it right, it's not gonna go through. So, and the question to you back is, you know, how old are you gonna be in 2030? And seven years more. You're all going to be starting your professional careers, making that impact and taking those fruits. So, you know, that's why the ingenuity that you have that you can learn now is when it's, it's what's going to pay off. So that, that would be the advice, you know, trust yourself, make mistakes. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone else? Julie. Um, I think for me, you know, just get experience, figure out all the opportunities you can to learn and to just be involved in projects. I, it's hard to imagine really many infrastructure or building or other design projects at this day and age that really don't involve sustainability, that don't involve having to think about these things. I mean, I would even add to, to the data <laughs> discussion that actually we really need data and we, we, we make all our decisions in the county and you know, we're trying to get funding or whatever else from the federal government or, or deal with things. We need to be able to quantify the sustainability impact of, of everything we're doing. And, and just being able to bring that expertise and knowledge to the table can be invaluable. And, and it really, at this point, I mean, we're looking at every department in Miami-Dade County, we need sustainability expertise. And, and it, it, like every project, it, it's relevant and everyone involved sort of has to kind of have a sense of how these it can be the SDGs or just these sustainability elements really come into play and to be able to, to, to speak to that. Mm -hmm. Great, excellent. Um, the industry is supporting, uh, the, is supportive in a way. I mean, the, the, the industry for the future architects, professionals, you can rely on the industry because they are serious company around the world working seriously and trying to bring more data to but um it, it the industry is reliable and uh it's it's something that it should be part of of, of the community professionals authorities the industry mm -hmm. great marilis i think um i i agree with everything that's been said. I think what I would add, and it was part of your video, I think, earlier as well, the importance of understanding that you have expertise, but making it real through partnerships with others. Um, this is These are, are problems much, much too big to think that design alone can solve them. 
without the partnership of, of policy, of industry, of science, even with the best of your expertise, uh, you won't go far enough. But with partnerships, I think you can get almost anywhere. Mm -hmm. so, so reach out um, and know that you have something valuable to contribute to the enterprise. Fantastic. All right, let's have a big round of applause for the panel. And, and now we have some time for Q&A. So let me pass the mic. Yeah. Yeah. No, so we can share. Maybe. Share. Actually, maybe good. I guess I have to make any PSAs. Okay. All right. Nick. Or oh, Nathan, you had a question? Hello, hello. Uh, great talk, great talk. Um, I had a question regarding policy, uh, so I guess to speak to you. Um, so how aggressive would you say policymakers are with making these changes based off SDG? And, and a follow-up question, uh, to what extent are policies tested before they're implemented? Hmm. Um, well, <laughs> you know, just in terms of things moving quickly, I think the Inflation Reduction Act is a really um, good example of a policy that's having just profound impact. And where we, it could be called just the Climate Action Act or, or something to that effect. All the funding in it is really geared towards that. How much the policies are tested, just to take the IRA as an example again, I mean, there are big components of funding in that that are related to innovation and research and development. and. So the policies and, and the funding that will come out of that, the projects that will come up out of that, um, won't all be known now and won't all be tested ahead of time. And that's part of what, you know, we need to be able to do. That said, I, I think, you know, working for a local government, there's a, a certain hesitancy to take risk with the public's money. You know, you don't want to be, you know, just taking a gamble or doing something that's untested. So, you know, we're looking right now at having to rebuild a, a solid waste campus. And we have all sorts of different companies approaching us with this innovation or that. And, um, and I guess this goes to infrastructure as much as it does policy. But there's um, probably some hesitancy to, to step out too far on a limb. But, but we want the best and the, the greatest technology and that's going to be the most environmentally effective. Um, but there tends to be trends. I think you, you look at, you know, Florida... If we're, maybe not the state of Florida is the best example, but even here we have adaptation policies, we have policies to deal with climate resiliency, um, but generally like we have a building efficiency um, ordinance in the city of Miami, for example, and that requires building efficiency benchmarking. That came about because there were lots of ordinances like it in other cities, and, and policy tends to be something that happens um, through larger organizations and coalitions um, and, and kind of implementing similar policies across similarly situated type governments. Um, and right now, I think in the US, there's been a lot happening in Europe over recent years that probably affects our policy to some degree and affects, I mean, like we don't have a price on carbon in the US, but there is there's much more sort of movement towards that and there's um i think just private recognition recognition of that in the private sector um and a lot of that's coming from a stronger policy push probably in europe um so th i think policies tend to go in trends and and there is some testing but there's always you know some some entities some states some local governments or, or or national governments that are going to have to be the leaders at one point or the other but you know it probably follows from logically whatever was the, was the step before. Uh, if I, I can uh, add, yeah. sorry, it's like nobody wants to be the first. But when there's a first, then, you know, the floodgate opens. Right. And then everybody wants to be the first. Yeah. And, yeah. and case in point is the chief heat officer, Jane Gilbert in Miami-Dade County, was the first chief heat, heat officer worldwide. And now there's a lot of chief heat officers everywhere else. So there's a lot to be said about that. The fear of missing out, I think, is a powerful motivator. Right? It, absolutely. <laughs> and, I mean, and it was so foretelling that we had a chief heat officer in place, and then we've had, you know, some of the hottest summers that we've had in history, the hottest summers in 
in our, the Earth's history, but um, it, it's been really fortunate to have that support system in place to be able to, to handle that situation a little better in Miami-Dade County, and it has. But, th- but that said, I mean, we had the first chief heat officer, but it was um, the ARSH Center that really um, helped support that through the county initially, and, you, and a lot of times you have outside entities that help push governments and support lo- local governments to, to take these policy positions and and Jane Gilbert was the first, but then soon after, we had sort of a, a deluge of other chief heat officers from, from other cities across the world. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, they were able to, to support each other and join together through that collaboration with the Arsh Center. They now have a network, I think. Yeah. Global. All right, other questions? Yes, over here. Thank you, and I thank you again for being here and talking with us. I really appreciate it. I'm sure we all do. Um, so my question really relates to architecture um, students and getting out into the field. Um, we've been told, you know, over and over again that you get to be creative and learn a lot in uh, while we're here, and then we get pigeonholed into a very unsupportive um, climate uh, afterwards. And we just have to do what developers say or what the codes say. You know, there's not much change or development that um, like it's just unsupportive. But maybe I'm wrong. Um, what has been, uh, your experience and how do you, um, deal with, you know, other disciplines if they're not necessarily supportive of the the sustainable development goals? So I'll I'll give you from, from an engineering point of view and, you know, if architecture can be tough, engineering is, um, forgiveless, but, um, I think you need to get engaged with the associations and the industries that are leading your area, right? So for instance, we were talking about the building code, right? And you have to follow the building code. Well, get engaged with the international building code, right? The IBC is what we follow. There's public hearings. You can propose language. I mean, you would think you can't, but there's a venue for that, right? Get um, standards, right? We all use standards, ASTM. Anybody heard of ASTM, right? Whatever you use, you need to ASTM specification. You got to specify all your materials and whatnot. You can get engaged in the ASTM committee, participate in the committee, and develop your own specifications if it doesn't exist. So I think we forget about that. You know, everything exists for a reason, and it can be changed, right? It is a, it's a dynamic thing. And I think sometimes we're afraid you get into a big room, everybody has white hair, and you're sort of like, they know more than me. But the reality is that they know... Probably as much as you do, they might know other things, but you know other things they don't know. And is that difference in that, you know, synergy of partnership that then people bring their own opinion. So I think don't be afraid. And if you're in a company, you know, find out, can I get engaged in this other external organization, a committee, you know, with the, with, with the county, with the state. So I think you should do that in addition to your job. And then you might come to this developer that is very stubborn and say, yeah, but did you know about the Inflation Act? If we develop an EPD and whatnot, we can Im- implement this. And so I think that's part of the thing. You know, we forget about that side of the world and we get in this sort of tunnel vision of I want to get from A to B to C, but there's this other parallel path and you can for sure take both. So mm-hmm. Great. Thank you, Francisco. Yes, over here. Uh, Emma. Um, I have a question for Francisco, and my question is if you can explain a little bit more about um, carbon biocapture technology. So very briefly, and um, I think if we go to the next slide, if that's possible. So most heavy industries, whatever it is, this is an example for concrete. Did you know that concrete, I love concrete, all disclosures, I get excited. So concrete is the second most consumed product in the world per capita. That's after fresh water. We consume a lot of concrete, right? And typically people think concrete is very, very bad for an environment. It's not actually, it's a very efficient material from a carbon consumption. It's kind of like a car. If you leave your car parked in your garage and you don't use it, it's very efficient. It doesn't make any emissions, right? But the moment that you start driving and driving and driving, there's more emissions. And because we use a lot of concrete, a lot of it, then it, there's a lot of emissions related to it. And that's why if concrete were a country worldwide, it would be the third emittent of CO2. So part of what carbon biocapture is doing is capturing the emissions 
directly from the cement production. Cement being 80% of the emissions of concrete is because of the cement is kind of one of the ingredients. That means that immediately where they are being issued, right, at the heavy industrial side, those emissions are captured. 80 to 90% of those emissions are avoided. And the, how are they captured? By a technology that has existed for millennia, right? Microalgae, algae that basically consume the CO2 and the nitrates and the oxides that are being emitted. And as a result, there's a byproduct, right? It's a chemical reaction after all. Uh, it's kind of this algae. And that algae can be used as a fertilizer, can be used as biodiesel. There's a whole lot of different other applications downstream. So I think you have that holy trinity, what you know uh, was mentioned before. You have a, a, a society component, you have an environmental component, and an economic component, right? And that's sort of the holy trinity when we look at sustainability. Um, so that's kind of in essence, and it's a scalable solution, right? You can uh, add more of these panels. We have a couple outside, but the the you know in summary, we're capturing emissions at point source without cleaning, filtering, or cooling down those emissions. And you can apply them to carbon plants and to other heavy industrial plants. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe one or two more questions in the back, anybody? Yes, way in the back. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my question was kind of aimed towards Daniel. Uh, so in terms of materiality, uh, for the factory that you showed us in Vietnam, uh, I'm running into like a similar issue with our design one project. So, uh, to walk, walking as in walking the fine line between showing much vegetation, floral and fauna, and then the contrast between concrete and steel, how do you make it? So the space still is inviting and welcoming while being a factory and, and that kind of issue. Uh, it, um, the, the question is uh, probably what is um, the, the, you don't think that the material is, um, I, I'm going to, give back the, the question, you think that concrete steel, it's not an appealing type of uh, material? I, I'm a big fan of the materials. It's just, it's a fine line to walk. And eventually you might get commentary that's like, this looks like a hospital in Hialeah, that it's like cold and, and not like sterile type type of feel. But your images show a space that's inviting and if i work there i would want to be more time there than probably i needed to but i i guess that um the material yes it's, 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 it was chosen because it, it invites it has a, a um an appealing with the nature with the type of living uh of the people that there are there we had um, um, things that, um, for example, it was, um, we, we couldn't put chairs or tables, regular tables, because the, the culture of the people is to work sitting on the floor. So the concrete also works in, in a way with, with the temperature. It, it, it's, it was impossible to put, I don't know, carpet, wood, um, and uh, in a way, it's the material that you, we were able to get it in on 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 the place inside. Uh, there's a lot of buildings uh, built of tilt walls that are, are foreign uh, production. They're not even done in Vietnam. So also that was part of, of what we consider as local um, products, basics, and. Uh, it's it's uh, it's absolutely minimalist the concept of the material that were used. So basically, as as we said, concrete are part of the structure, and a metal roof, and that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Don. All right, one more. Can I ask one more? Yes. Um, I, I was just uh, thank you very much for the panel. It was really terrific. Um, I wanted to you know we had this exciting news. The U.S. Department of Commerce just announced that our region is a 
is a resilience uh, is an environmental resilience tech hub. And I was wondering if anybody on the panel would recommend to students, how do you, you're at this moment when our region is kind of going to be blossoming as a tech hub in environmental resilience, how would you recommend to the students to approach opportunities uh, that might come up? Are there any immediate things that the county might be doing or are there other, other things that um, universities might be involved with? But thank you. Um, I wish I had more information about upcoming events. I know, you know we have an uh, office of innovation and economic development um, in the county and the mayor's office that they, they led the development of, of that application and process. Um, and through that office is regularly involved, there's these climate tech um, meetups. Scarlett knows that. They're, they're often, often a Beacon Council. There's, um, they're a great place to just network and, and with, with folks in the, the tech space in Miami. It's, it's kind of exciting that, um, you know, we, we've had a lot of startups in Miami, but I feel like we're at a point where there's more support for growth of startups and for sort of moving to that next level, especially with this designation. Um, but that's one of, I think, the, the best starting points, I think, for just being able to network. I imagine there will be other events coming up. We also have um, a newsletter through our office, through the Office of um, Resilience. Um, I would suspect that any upcoming events open to the public, there'll be opportunities to participate in that we would um, promote them through our newsletter. So you can sign up for that. Um, I, I don't know if the Office of Economic um, of Innovation and Economic Development has their own newsletter, but um, you, can, you can start with that. <laughs> yeah, if I may add, add to that. So it's, um, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that. We, we, it was just announced. Um, it's a climate, climate tech hub. And it's Miami is one of only, I think, 27 cities in the country. So the Miami-Dade Beacon Council, along with the county, started this process like a year ago, right? So a lot of entities came together. So Opportunity Miami and the county is leading that effort. And uh, I'll be happy to join, um, to connect you to the um, listserv to whoever, like if, if you can share my, my email, I am, I'll connect you to where, because they meet on a monthly basis in the Beacon Council in, in the Brickell area. So students can join, professors, uh, anyone that, that wants to be a part of it can be a part. And there's actually different committees, like four committees, as simple as engagement committee and then more techie <laughs> committees. So yes, I'm more than happy to, to connect you to that group because I'm, I'm part of that group as well. And I have a last, last question for you all. <laughs> so quickly, if you had to champion one SDG, each of you, which one would it be and why? Well, I'll, I'll start with number nine, obviously. Industry, innovation, and infrastructure is um, buildings and infrastructure is 40% of the total emissions, of which after they're being built is 70% of the resources and 30 uh, you use to maintain them, right? So, huge impact. You did say it before. Yeah, cities will win this war. I would correct uh, Mr. Moon and say it's materials will win this war, right? And applying materials and how we're using materials uh, differently and thinking how to use them uh, in different ways as well. So, I think it's that one because of, again, they're all important. I think I, I like the fussiness that you had before because you do something and it's sort of butterfly effect if it affects all of them, but if I have to choose one, I think that will be the one. Daniel, and then Julie. <laughs> yeah, I think industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Uh, and I think, uh, I'm not gonna say that one was more important than the other, but that mm -hmm. is Julie? Um, I'd say climate action, um, because it, it just encompasses so much. I think, you know, there's so many activities we do just, just to address climate change that that can fit into protecting water, the, to clean energy, to, to infrastructure, um, kind of covers across the board. And honestly, it's just a, 
it's an easy one to like so much of the work I do that we're always sort of, does this fit with our, does this align with our climate goals? Does this align with what we're trying to do to, to address climate change, both from an adaptation perspective and from a mitigation perspective? So mm -hmm. I think it would be that one. And I think I'd end up at number 11 in cities um, for all the reasons that you've already stated, right? If we're looking at um, a, a very near future where more than 75% of our population will be living in urban areas. They are complex, they are critical, and they are the place for maximum impact. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. And Scarlett, I'll, I'll jump in with, with mine, but I, I mean, I think education for all, no surprise as an educator and practitioner, but I think it kind of goes back to, John, your, your comment, um, we are, I think, in the right place at the right time, where we are today in Miami. Um, institutions like ours, you know, uh, UM, our county, FIU, we are living an accelerated version of these issues, you know, because we are a metropolis, uh, vulnerable to climate. We are, uh, in our in, in landscape architecture department, we always point out that the tropics and the subtropics is where the great majority of the world lives now and was one of the most vulnerable. And it's also one of the regions where most of the world is moving to, believe it or not. So if you can get educated here and you can take chances here and you can learn from people like Julie and Daniel and Marilise, I think there's really no better place, no better time. So I'm all for education for all starting in Miami and FIU. So, great. <laughs> All right, so we, we have some exhibits outside. I want to encourage everybody to go out and speak to the experts uh, uh, on the first level by the umbrellas. Hopefully we had all the rain we were going to have earlier. We don't know, but hopefully it's all good. So please go out and thank you all for coming.